you would, open your Bibles to John chapter 6. And, uh, you know, sometimes the Spirit is so sweet, you just, you don't want to say anything. You don't want to tell a joke, you want to go straight into the Word of God. And so that's why I just want to tell you a true story instead. There once was a, there was a, a black woman who had a mighty powerful prayer life. And every morning she would go out onto her front porch and she would pray, Oh Lord, thank you for your grace. Thank, thank you for this wonderful morning. Thank you for the sunrise. Thank you for all your blessings. And she would just go on and on and on. And she was so, so loud when she would do it. And here's the thing, she had a neighbor, true story, she had a neighbor, and the neighbor was an atheist. And every morning, that atheist neighbor, he had to hear the prayer of this woman going on and on, thank you for all your blessings, oh good Lord, over and over. Well, one day, hard times fell, and this woman ran out of money. And her cabinets began to get bare, and her groceries went really skim, and and so she came out and she started praying. And she said, oh, Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for your blessings. Lord, you know I'm faithful. You know I'm going to follow you no matter where you go. But, Lord, I need groceries. And she prayed that for about 30 minutes, crying out to God, send groceries. Well, that atheist got an idea. And he went on out to the grocery store. And he filled that cart with groceries, just filled, piled it up. And then he took and he put those groceries on the front porch of the woman. And the woman comes out and she says, oh, praise the Lord, praise Jesus. Groceries at my front door. And around that time, the atheist pops out and he says, ah, I got gotcha. you. I brought those groceries. And then she said, praise the Lord, the devil brought them. <laughs> I'll tell you what, that is having a positive outlook. That is knowing that no matter what this world throws our way, no matter what hardships or anything like that, God is in control. He takes ashes and he makes beautiful paintings. He takes broken vessels and he turns them into useful vessels of honor. He's a mighty God. Tonight I want to talk about being a God follower, continuing this, finishing this up this evening. And I want to talk about fallen followers. Fallen followers. If you would like, you can open to John chapter 6 if you have not done that already. And as we recap just briefly this, uh, this evening, we started this series in Matthew chapter 4 and in Mark chapter 1 as we looked at the definition of a God follower. There we, there we see in the book of Mark, we see that he gives us the idea, come ye and follow me, come ye after me, in other words, is what he was really saying. And we see that when we combine that with what Matthew said, and the idea of following him, we see that the idea is not only a physical aspect, because friends, our testimonies are worthless if the life we live does not reflect Christ Jesus. And so we must follow him physically, in the things that we do, and the way we live our lives, and what people see in us. But we also have to do that in a right heart. And that's what Matthew tells us. Not only are we going in the direction that he's leading us, but we do it with the heart of Jesus Christ. And we consider the heart of Jesus Christ as we look at that the heart of God is to save lost souls. The heart of God is a heart that says, I will follow you no matter where you go, and, 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 and I will always serve you. It is always having the same concept. And as we will read, even this evening, we remember that there are, uh, there are many who may walk the walk, but because they do not have Christ's heart, they will ultimately walk away. Because they do not have Christ's heart as they walk the walk. We made this statement that you can mimic Jesus without having his heart, but you cannot, you cannot have his heart without mimicking his actions. Next, we were in John chapter 12, and, and, and we read there in John chapter 12, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. And we asked the question, what are you living for? Jesus had to physically die on the cross. That was his job. That was something only he could do in order to purchase salvation for each and every one of us. And but friends, he's not asking us to die on the cross for sins. He's already done that. But a God follower must die deadly, or daily to self. 
Verse 25 says, He that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life uh, in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. And so the simple truth with that was this, that live for self today and die for eternity, or live eternally by living for Christ today. And last night, we looked at being faithful to the call in Luke chapter 19. And that idea of we must do something. We must do something with the pound or with the gospel that Jesus Christ has given us to disperse. We remember that that gospel, although we are redeemed, we are his, and we become in that moment his servants, his slaves. He is our master. He still gives each of us the responsibility, the obligation to share the gospel with others. He tells us to occupy. And remember what that means? It means to do business as, to do the work of, and to take that out so that others may hear that thing. And remember that it's the only way that you can fail as a child of God in doing the work of sharing the gospel is by not doing it. Because the desire of the Lord, of course he desires that all might come to repentance, but his desire for you as his child is just that you do the work whether you get a hundredfold or whether you're one of those Jeremiah's and nobody ever listens, you will still hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant, if you are faithful in sharing and being a part of taking that gospel out into the world to our neighbors and to everybody we run into. Friends, there are, it, is, it is so easy to find people who need to hear the gospel. Last night, as we went to, uh, we went to Waffle House, because that's what you do, I guess. I don't know how that turned out. We ended up not getting back till a little after, right around 2 o'clock, I think. Something like that, Brother David and I. But wouldn't you know it, as we sat down, we were able to speak to our waiter. And you could just tell something was a little uh, off in his demeanor, I guess. And, and we said, well, how are you doing? And he said, I'm sore. And I said, why are you sore? Well, I was in an accident. And we were able to share the gospel with him. I was able to speak with him afterwards. I don't know if David saw this or not, but we were, I was able to grab his hand and say, man, can I pray with you? It's amazing that even though he told me he had no desire to be in church and some things happened when he was younger, when I said, young man, if, can I pray with you? He said, absolutely. And I reached my hand out. He grabbed mine right in the middle of everything going on. And I prayed with him and was able to share the gospel with him. Friends, it's so simple. I didn't expect necessarily for uh, anything to happen. I mean, that's God's business. It's not mine. My job is to share. Today, as we wrap up, we are talking about fallen followers. This is a message that is kind of near and dear to my heart. So we'll be reading from John chapter 6. And John focuses on the deity of Jesus Christ. He focuses on the deity of Jesus Christ. He records how Jesus revealed himself as eternal God, saying before Abraham was, I am. Here in chapter 6, he shows that Jesus is Lord over provisions as he feeds over 5,000. And because of the miracles, the throng of the people that were fed and many others began to follow Jesus, beginning to press upon him. And this is earlier in the ministry, whereas in the other messages we've been talking later in the ministry. And so Jesus was already gaining a population of, of followers and of fans and people who were, they wanted to see more of who Jesus Christ was. And, and there's many people who are following Jesus by the time we get into, into John chapter 6. But what the people were following for was to see the things that Jesus was doing. But their desire in seeing his power is that he might rise up and physically take up on the throne of a David and reestablish the nation. Stand against those who are holding them into captivity. But then John shows us that Jesus is Lord even over the elements. He is the God of creation. And I spoke about this last Sunday with my church. And just to mention this, whenever we see the miracles in the word of God, the miracles that Jesus did are miracles of creativity. 
When he made the blind to see, he wasn't simply repairing their eyes. He was giving them new eyes. When Jesus restored the lame, he didn't just take those legs and make them work again. He gave them new legs. When Jesus restored the lepers, he gave them new skin. When Jesus had control over the storms and walking on the water, as we see there, he isn't just saying that this is something I can do as a magic trick. He's saying, I created it, and I have authority over it, and I will do with it whatever I please. That's the power of Jesus Christ. And he's revealing this over and over. And friends, you cannot read through the book of John and not see Jesus as God. And John focuses on the idea is that Jesus is the Son of God, and therefore he is God. And so I love reading the book of John or John's writings because he, he does such a great job at that. Because of everything that Jesus has done, we see once again that his fame is not only far-reaching, but that those that have seen him and have heard him and now are seeking him everywhere he goes. In the case of our text, these people that are here now in, in this passage of Scripture, they have gone up to Capernaum. They have traveled by way of water on the western side of the Sea of Galilee some seven, eight miles and I don't know if this was a sailboat or if it was a rowboat, but whatever the situation was, they were serious about getting to where Jesus was at. And so let's go ahead and pick up and just start to read what's happening here. Look at verse 26 in John chapter 6. Where Jesus says to him, he says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, you seek me not because you saw the miracles, but because you did eat of the loaves and you were filled and so he goes on to say, labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him hath God the Father sealed. Again, Lord, we come to you. We thank you for your word. God, we ask that the weight of your word sink into the depths of our hearts, Lord, that we carry it with us, that, we, that you reveal yourself to us even tonight. And God, I pray that we leave this place blessed, but Lord, maybe even a little different than how we walked in as we have fallen deeper in love with you. We love you and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So Jesus speaks to them. And then for the next 40 verses, the next 40 verses, Jesus unapologetically just unleashes on them the truth of who he was, the truth of who they were, and the truth about what they were really seeking after. He tells them what it means to be a God follower. Over and over, he reveals himself as the bread of life, as the true life, as life everlasting, and, and, and that only through him you can come to God the Father. And still... Still, after just 40 verses of just unleashing this on them, just this was an outright lecture that Jesus is giving to them here. Still, they were not listening. Still, they didn't hear, and they would not receive his truth. Friends, sometimes you can preach and preach and preach as someone. You can show them all of the evidence. You can take them to every passage of Scripture, and still they will not hear. And they will not believe. And that is the case, even here. And friends, this is Jesus that is teaching them. He exposes them for who they really were. Where their actual motives were at. These people were not God followers. Some of them may have been. Some of them may have gone on to become. But in general, these people... We're not, we're not God followers. Please follow that thought tonight. And we have discussed this, that not everybody who says I'm a disciple really is a disciple. Not everybody who, who says, you know, I'm a God follower is a God follower. Not everybody, just because they got the Jesus sticker or they got the, the fish on their bumper, that doesn't necessarily qualify them as God followers. And these people, as Jesus is speaking to them, yes, they've gone a long way to hear about Je or to see Jesus. But he looks at them and he unveils the truth. You are not here for the Messiah. You're here for the meal. You're here because you either were fed or you heard about the feeding. 
And so you're hoping once again to get free food. And Jesus teaches them that experiencing God is not about the snacks. I love that idea, that it's snacks. When Jesus broke those loaves and fishes and he fed them, man, that was a wonderful, miraculous meal. But friends, it's just the tip of the iceberg for what God does. And then uh, we see the call of Jesus to come ye after me. It is not about Jesus meeting your needs. It is about you living for him eternally. Listen to this verse that Jesus gives us in chapter 15. This is advanced. This is uh, in, in an upper room discourse as we see these chapters that are clustered together. And Jesus says in verse 16 of John 15, listen, Ye have not chosen me. Friends, there are some hard passages of scriptures in the word of God that we would be wise to underline to learn and be familiar with. And this is one of them. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever you shall ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. Jesus' statement here is absolutely clear. You cannot mess this up. You have not chosen me. What does that mean? It means that Jesus is not our pet toy. That we can't just say, hey, let me, you know, I'm kind of bored. I'm going to get out. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play with Jesus for now, you know. He is not our genie in a bottle that when we have a need, we pull that thing out and we rub on that. And we say, hey, this is what I need. He's none of those things. You know who Jesus is? If you're saved, if you're redeemed, we've said this. He's your master. He's your Lord. He's the one who calls the shots. He's the ones that you're following. He is not at your whim. You are at his whim. That is the separation between those who would be disciples and those who are disciples. They understand the difference, that my life is not my own. I did not say, all right, Jesus, I'm choosing you. You do whatever I need. We come to him realizing that he chose us, he delivers, he commands our every step. We are to respond. That's the important part here. Jesus' statement is so absolutely clear. And so he says in verse 56 of our text, John 6, he says, He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me and I in him. Friends, God followers, listen to these things. They are not marked by those who show up for fellowship meals but will not show up for visitation. God followers are not marked by those who attend singings but won't attend services. God followers are not marked by those who gossip, but will not be discipled. No one wants to say amen, and yet the truth is very deep into that statement. There is evidence of a God follower, and it speaks loud and clear. There are would-be God followers, and then there are those who truly follow. To be a God follower is to take in everything that is Christ. That's what that verse means in verse 56. You got to eat his flesh. You got to drink his blood. You got to take in everything that is Jesus. It's not a pick. It's not a buffet where you say, I want this or I want that. You take all of it. You live every way that he lives. You live in everywhere that he has called you to go. In every action, you commit to him solely. That's a God follower. And so look at verse 60. Many, therefore, of his disciples are doing exactly what many of you here tonight are doing as I say these things. 
Listen. Many, therefore, of his disciples, when they had heard this, this said, this is a hard saying. Who can hear it? Who can even hear this? Who can do, who can really submit to this life that Jesus Christ is living? Have you seen the way this guy lives? And he's saying we got to live the exact same way? And then in verse 61, he says, And when Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, I love this, Does this offend you? Does this offend you? Do you feel like your heart is pricked? Like, you know what? Maybe I'm not quite giving Jesus my all. Or maybe you're saying, okay, revival just ended. You can leave now. When Jesus was standing there and he's teaching those that have traveled all this way. I mean, they went a great way, right? They de they de you would think they deserve some type of acknowledgement, but that's not what they get. Jesus said, you didn't come because of who I am. You came for all the wrong reasons. If you really want to be a God follower, you got to go after me with all that you have. And you've got to mimic my every action, my every call. Friends, our churches are so full of would-be God followers. What our churches need is not just somebody to come in and, and preach at them. What our churches need is for the people to rise up and follow God. If we would do that, then God would turn the world upside down and it would start right here in this community and it, would, and it would flow out and out and out and it would reach into the world and people all over would eventually say, did you hear about what has God has done through the people who were submitted to him out of Bay Lake? The gospel would go and it would flourish like roses. So often... We only see the Jesus that we want to see, not Jesus for who he really is. And this was true of Jewish culture, and it has become even more true in our Western civilization. And when we even think about who Jesus is and what he looks like, he doesn't look like the, he doesn't look like the Jew that he would have been. He, oftentimes he looks like some Norwegian long-haired guy, right? But it fits our mold. You think I'm kidding about this? Why don't you go back in there and look at some of the kids' Sunday school curriculum. You tell me what Jesus looks like. And tell me that that doesn't stick in the minds and the hearts of people. And then we begin to Americanize Jesus. We begin to make him beautiful. We begin to make him not at all the man that is depicted for us right here in Scripture. The kind of man who will go to those fishermen, those rough and tough fishermen, and say, follow me, and they drop everything and follow that man. One songwriter said it like this. The truth is, is that in many of our churches, we wouldn't even accept the Jesus that we actually read about in the Word of God. And he goes on to say, the reason we would not, well, the dirt and the blood on his feet, that might stay in the carpet. These people who had traveled all this way had seen the prophet. They had seen Jesus. They knew that he didn't have a place to stay. They knew he didn't even have a pillow. They knew that his physical needs came last. And to be honest with you, when they traveled all that distance, they weren't looking and saying, oh, I hope I get to be homeless today. That wasn't in their mindset at all. They can't live that way. I can't live like Jesus. I got to eat. That's why I'm here, as a matter of fact. Can you feed me? And Jesus calls them out on it. Jesus says, no, no, no. If you really want to be a God follower, do what I do, live the way I live, and have my heart. You've got to do something with what God has given you. Really, that sounds so harsh. What about, what about our shut-ins? 
Friends, our shut-ins, more times than not, they have a telephone. They have grandchildren who come and visit them. Friends, what about those who work all kinds of hours? I just don't have time. Friends, you got, you got people you work with. You're setting an example, living that example. There is no excuse. There just isn't. Verse 66. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. They walked no more with him. Now guys, I want you to know, I, I believe that, I'm not, I don't want to speak for Brother Daryl or Brother Ben. And so I, I don't want to make waves, so to speak. But I just want you to know the passion of this. That God is most definitely, there is no doubt about this truth. God is most definitely always calling his children deeper. He is. You have not arrived. You've not. In the process of sanctification, as we become more and more like Jesus Christ with our daily living, we will not achieve that until we reach our glorification in glory. And so that means you've always got more to do. I do not apologize if the word of God offends you. I simply pray that our hearts would be stunned by this. This verse is a powerful reminder to me of something else, though. It is a reminder to me of the empathy that Jesus shares for pastors today. It's a reminder of that to me. Because as I think about all of those people that had come and, and they had come to see Jesus, and Jesus spoke truth at them, their response was not, you know what? I will follow Jesus. That wasn't their response. Their response was they turned and they walked with him no more. And so you can almost see Jesus in that, tw in that, that statement there. Uh, it goes on to talk about that Jesus with the 12, and we'll talk about it in a moment. But here at the, end of this, at the end of this discourse, there's Jesus, there's the 12, and all you see are the backs and the dust that they're kicking up as they walk away. And friends, Jesus understands the empathy. He empathizes with pastors on this level. Because all too often, there will be those in a church who will leave. They'll leave for all the wrong reasons. And I would have to say that most reasons are, most reasons are wrong. And what I mean by that is if we leave because of offense, if we leave because we're just not happy with how things are going, if we leave because we're no longer entertained, if we leave because, you know, we like the way they're doing it. These are all wrong reasons. Friends, if God has called you to this church, then he wants you to be at this church. He wants you to serve at this church. He wants you to grow at this church. And he has put in front of you men of God who love you, who pray for you, who study, and their great desire is to teach you how to become more and more like Jesus Christ. And yet so often we pour our hearts into the study of God's word. We hit our knees and we pray and we say, oh God, please, please, we ask that you would be with so and so and Lord, lift their hearts and let them know they're loved and let them know I desire that they would be comforted in this moment. We go and we visit in the middle of the night and, and we tell everybody, please pray for so and so. Our hearts pour into you. I cannot express how much our hearts pour into you. And still, still people leave. And our hearts break. They break. And a part of that is because you left and we lose that. But another part of that is because we have this mindset as preachers, and God instills this in men of God. I, it's, it's supernatural. And it's this thought of, I, I just wasn't 
finished with you. <laughs> I just, there's so much more I wanted to teach you about God's word. There's so much more. There's, I wanted to take you so much farther in discipleship. I had, in my mind, I could see you surrendering to God's ministry.